host. This is Shakespeare in London with Edward. So Edward, take it away. Okay, let's try it again, shall we? So someone asked in the chat, meanwhile, um, what my background is. So just very briefly, I studied classics at the University of Edinburgh, so Latin and Greek. And in my school days and at university, I was interested in just literature in general. And I'm now 33, and that's been a kind of lifelong interest. And about a year ago, I started doing these online tours. I used to be a tour guide in London, taking people around different themes, different areas, different all different things. And there's just been an increased interest for me in the last year to revisit my old interests and reignite them and offer them to people online. So yes, that's my, my background in a brief, brief, brief way. So and where yes, are you I was saying, before? oh, yeah, go on, Robert, sorry. Oh, I said, where are you originally from? You told us earlier, but for the folks who joined oh, us later. From, from Kent. Um, I was born near Canterbury. My, my parent, my family home, if you like, is still near, near Canterbury in the, the, the Kent countryside, about half an hour from Dover. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So this is one of the most likely images of Shakespeare that can actually capture his original look. It's taken from this, the first folio of his works that was published by some friends of his, Henry Condell and John Hemming in uh, 1623. So a little tiny brief bit about his early background before he moves to London, which is of course the theme of this talk. He was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, which is a few hours drive north of London. This is his actual birth house, which is quite amazing. You can still see the same room that he was born in and lived his childhood in, which is quite, quite amazing. So some of the earliest evidence of him, for example, is marrying Anne Hathaway in 1582. So Shakespeare's life is 1564 until 1616. So he marries Anne Hathaway in 1582. And in 1585, he uh, has two children, Hamnet and Judith. No one knows exactly when he moved to London. So the first mention of his plays is in 1592. So the theory is roughly around 1585, he may have moved to London most likely for work opportunities. One of the influences behind his, potential influences behind his theater interest are the mystery plays. So this is a medieval tradition in Europe where troops of actors would go around the countries and they would put on plays which would teach people about morality. They would teach people about the Bible how to behave, and they would also include things like humor and, and comedy. But the main reason was to, to teach people about the Bible. So it's very likely that a troop of actors would have come to Stratford-upon-Avon when Shakespeare was young and put on a play. Very little is concretely known about Shakespeare's life, so that's really not that clear. So let's say 1585, he moves to London. If it's anywhere in the 1580s, it's still a very interesting time in London's history. It's a time under Elizabeth I, who reigned from the 1550s up until 1603. It's a period called the Elizabethan Golden Age or the, the English Renaissance. It's a period of huge booming in trade, in art, in, in, in politics, there's a much more balanced sense of power. There's an increased awareness of the needs of the people. There's, yeah, there's lots of things going on in this period, which is a kind of allowing people to be more like in what we think of as today's society, having more equal opportunity. Of course, when I say equal opportunity, 
you have to be quite subjective about that back in the day. It wasn't really like that in the Elizabethan golden age, but there was a lot more of a freedom of expression and a freedom within trade, for example, increased opportunities in trade. For example, the first stock exchange, the Royal Exchange, which we'll touch on a bit later, is founded in London in, in this period. So it's this world of, of promise, of bubbling possibilities that Shakespeare enters into. This is an old, fairly accurate painting of London in the 1580s with the old London Bridge here, you can see, which was actually one of the marvels of uh, Europe at the time. It's a huge bridge going across the Thames, full of houses. Nowadays, the modern London Bridge is uh, kind of pale in comparison to what it used to be. Another view of, of the, the city of London here. It was actually very small compared to today's London, which is about 1500 square kilometers, 8 million people. The original city of London was about one square mile big. There were these old Roman walls going around the center and outside of these walls, you were outside of the, the limits of the authority of the city of London. So if you were north in this area up here called Shoreditch, for example, or if you were in the south, on the south bank or in Southwark, you were actually outside of the laws of the city. And these areas are where we find the earliest theatres, because the city of London were very careful about theatres, partly because of the plague. If you had large numbers gathering in one place, that was seen as bad for the passing of diseases such as the plague very topical for our times today. Amazingly, some photos survive from the Victorian era in the late 1800s of Elizabethan London. Before these buildings were mostly knocked down, they were photographed. So you can still see black and white photos of this Elizabethan, well, Tudor at least, London from the 1500s. And this street here, um, which you can see the difference between then and, and today, where it's a very, very different look with these big wide streets. Whereas back in Shakespeare's time, London would have been incredibly densely packed. There were not, well, there were a couple of big wide streets, but uh, most of it was very um, sort of alleys and little pokey places. Some examples still survive today in areas of largely central London where you still get these little thin alleys which keep their medieval plan but are largely 17, 1800s buildings. One of the best surviving facades of these this Elizabethan London, Tudor London, is the Staple Inn in Chancery Lane in West London where you can see this Tudor building design still to this day. One of the first places that Shakespeare lived, which is recorded in documents, as I said before, there are very few, I think less than 20 <laughs> recorded instances of Shakespeare in history, which is quite amazing, as in actual legal documents about where he was, what he was doing. One of the first is in the north part of the city of London which is St. Helen's Bishop's Gate. This is a church that was built in the, the 1400s. And so this church is the same church that Shakespeare would have actually known, lived around and seen, and has miraculously survived the Great Fire of London, two world wars and all kinds of redevelopment programs. So it's a real old taste of the medieval London. It's got this incredible contrast to the gherkin building skyscraper behind it. One interesting theory recently is that living in this area when Shakespeare was fairly young and beginning to be a playwright, he was lodging with a doctor and that he would have known potentially this in this affluent area, some quite interesting people, some diplomats, tradesmen, merchants, travelers, politicians, 
and potentially got input for all of the varied topics of his plays in the future. So it's just a theory, but I find it quite an interesting, interesting element to it, to his life. Because people often say, how could this guy from Stratford-upon-Avon who had no proper official education at Oxford or Cambridge come to write all these incredible works of, of history and culture and all this? But um, one can imagine it is potentially possible. And the reason why he moved to this part of the north of the city of London was because just north of the walls was this area called Shoreditch. And in this area was one of the earliest theatres built in the 1580s called The Theatre. This was outside of the walls. As I said, it was outside of the authority of the city of London. They didn't have any ability to apply those laws in a direct way to this area. Um, some kind of idea of what it looked like inside. Today, the spot is marked by a pretty nondescript Victorian warehouse building, which is now shops in Shoreditch. Still a very fashionable area for partying, for the sort of edgy, grungy side of life, which is what the theater was back in the Victor uh, sorry, the Shakespearean Elizabethan era. And it's here that some of his earliest plays are put on like Richard II, where you have this very famous quote. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, the seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. Another theater north of the walls of the city of London was the Curtain. In the recent, I think uh, 10 or 20 years ago, they've been demolishing old buildings on this site and building a new development and have discovered the remains of the Curtain the Theater. And this place where you can still go and see the building site where there'll soon be a, a block of flats in its place and offices is where, for example, Romeo and Juliet was first ever performed in the 1590s. And this famous quote from Romeo staring up at Juliet on her balcony before she's seen him. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Her eye in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. But on a slightly downer side, and interestingly, a part in Shakespeare's life where it seems that the plays take on a more tragic element is in 1597, when Hamnet, his son, dies. And this is by a lady in King John, which is around the same time that Hamnet dies, when Constance says this, grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Then, have I reason to be fond of grief? Fare you well, had you such a loss as I. I could give better comfort than you do. I will not keep this form upon my head when there is such disorder in my wit. 
O Lord, my boy, my Arthur, my fair son, my life, my joy, my food, my all the world. So it's potentially a fascinating insight into Shakespeare's own personal life. Although one of the famous debates about Shakespeare is how much can be gleaned from his works as to his personal life. But this is certainly a very, very poignant moment in Shakespeare's works about the loss of a son, which he did have around this time. The remains of the Curtain Theatre will be eventually presented in this new building block so that you can see this sort of circular shape where the theatre used to be. So in 1599, the City of London, there's a, a legal dispute between different owners of these theatres north of the wall. And so Shakespeare and his company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, they move down to the South Bank of the City of London. Again, this area is outside of the authority of the City of London. Some bits that survive to this day from this era. Um, this, there's a famous museum called the Clink because there was actually a, a prison on the south bank of the Thames. But one of the more tangible things that survive is part of the Bishop of Winchester's palace. So this was a palace that the Bishop of Winchester, Winchester would use whenever he came to London. And actually in the Second World War, this area was heavily bombed and this archaeological remain <laughs> arose, and it's part of the main hall, which once would have been part of the, the Winchester, Winchester, Bishop of Winchester's palace here. The bishops of Winchester had a huge business going on with the prostitutes on the South Bank. This was the entertainment district of London, and they were called the Winchester geese, these working women of the night, if you like. This is one of the main attractions of the, the South Bank of the city of London, that you could go there and you were not bound by the laws of the city. One interesting element to Shakespeare, as I mentioned earlier, was the mystery plays. And this is another drawing of a mystery play being put on in a courtyard of an inn. And luckily for us, one of these inns still survives, largely as it would have looked like roughly at the time of Shakespeare. I say roughly because this pub, the George Inn, it actually burnt down in the late 1600s, but was rebuilt on its original design. So it's still a pub to this day on the south bank of the Thames, just a few minutes walk from London Bridge on the main entrance up into London from the rest of Europe and from Dover. It's pretty amazing that it still exists. It's the only galleried pub left in London with these galleries up here. Many inns in London used to have these. You can see old photos from the Victorian era of horse and, horse and cart still coming in to take their rest overnight, stay overnight in this inn and then carry on their journey. This is actually very close to where Geoffrey Chaucer started the Canterbury Tales in his book, in his series of poems. It's actually just behind the George called the Tabard Inn. Another image of the George here with its courtyard. So you can still go there today and uh, have a drink there. So yes, this is the area of Southwark, south of the city of London an area of entertainment, of debauchery, of crime, of fun, all the things which the, the authorities seem to dislike. Zooming in on this area in this old engraving from the... Garden and the Globe, this Shakespeare's theatrical life. So the Bear Garden is actually quite interesting because there's actually a street called the Bear, Bear Gardens quite near to where the Globe is, where the Bear Garden Theatre was. 
And it's quite interesting that Queen Elizabeth, for example, and Henry VIII, they weren't, it seems, that interested in the plays, at least they didn't. It doesn't show up that they loved the plays in particular, whereas it does show up that they really enjoyed bear baiting, where a series of dogs would be sent into an arena and would try to take down this huge bear. So that goes alongside with the theater at this time. So it's a very different way that we associate theater today than how it was in the 1500s, where it was much more, I guess, raucous. So yes, the globe, this is the original, the drawing of the original globe um, on the South Bank. Where Shakespeare's globe today is, which is a recreation by an American businessman in the 80s, Sam Wanamaker, the original globe is actually a few minutes walk from the recreation, the reconstruction of Shakespeare's globe. It's not, so where Shakespeare's globe is today, the building where you can go and watch plays is not the original place. The original place is actually a little site here where there are still houses, where if you go there, you can read different plaques about Shakespeare. There are different information and you can see this circle in the ground. This was the original site of the globe. So if you ever go to London interested in Shakespeare, I'd highly recommend going to this place because this is where, for example, plays like Hamlet were first ever recorded as being put on. So you can stand in this little street. It's never very busy in London. And imagine these words, these famous words first being spoken. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache in the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. If you tune in in about five, three hours time, I'll be explaining more about Hamlet and that speech. <laughs> Little plug there. So yes, you can still go to this site of the original site of the globe. This is the recreation hard, hard fought for by Sam Wanamaker, an incredible effort on his part to actually secure the lineage of Shakespeare and have this recreation built where you can still go year round to see Shakespeare plays put on in this space, which tries to recreate the original theatrical experience where you would have people, for example, paying a lot more to sit up in the high stands, but paying very little to sit down in the low stands. It's recorded that people were shouting out, people were shouting out in plays, they were crying along with the actors. It wasn't necessarily the same kind of respectful silence we have when watching a play. It was much more raucous. And if people needed to go to the bathroom, for example, then they would just go to the bathroom <laughs> where they were standing while being quite drunk or whatever it was. So a very different experience than, than today. One of the buildings in the South Bank that still exists from Shakespeare's time is Southwark Cathedral. So it's, it would have been largely the same kind of Gothic structure that Shakespeare would have seen and would have very likely worshiped in because he moved here from the north of London to the South Bank, and it's presumed at least that he lived in the South area of London during this time that he was working at the Globe. He was an actor for much of his life in the plays until about 1604. He stops writing in 1613, 
Um, so he was actually involved in the plays that he was writing. This is the Gothic interior of this chapel, this cathedral, sorry, Southwark Cathedral. And his brother, Edmund Shakespeare, is actually buried here. So one can imagine that Shakespeare himself, William, was certainly visiting the cathedral at some point. There's also a little open area. Again, it was an area that was actually bombed during the Second World War and has luckily, in a way, been left a bit open. This is right in the north part of the city of London, where Shakespeare seems to have moved from the south up to the north, and he takes lodgings in 1604 at the house here of Christopher and Mary Mountjoy, which is today just a tiny little park but it has this plaque. And again, it's here that various works of his, various plays of his were actually written. So you can actually, again, go to one of these spots. And if you like Shakespeare or you like the, the effervescence and the continuation of history to go and sit or visit this little tiny place, again, it's never busy. Um, and imagine Shakespeare in a house on this site writing some of his most famous plays. The record of him living here is from a legal case where he was required to be a witness to one of the legal cases of Mary and Christopher Mountjoy. So it's kind of a, a mistake or a, a, a perchance that we get to know that he lived there. Another place that he lived is in Blackfriars, which is an area in West Central London where there used to be a monastery for the Blackfriars. Who were a series of uh, who were a system of monks before the dissolution of the monasteries in the early 1500s, when the monasteries in England largely got demolished or their lands got sold and taken over by individuals to develop them. And Shakespeare took on a house here, which it's not known if he actually lived in it, but it was a house that he bought. And there's a plaque. Uh, oh, sorry, the Blackfriars area is just, just over here, by the way. Uh, it's called the Cockpit Pub to this day. It's an old Victorian pub, which is very lovely to go into. And opposite, it says, on the 10th of March, 1613, Shakespeare Post lodgings in the Blackfriars Gatehouse located near this site. So there's a, another element of Shakespeare's life. The building itself is Victorian, but the basement, the actual cellars underneath the pub are from the, the medieval era. And the reason he moved here is because in 1603, his company changed from the Lord Chamberlain's men to the King's men under the new King, James I, after Queen Elizabeth I died. And they used this site of the Blackfriars Theatre, which was one of the first indoor theatres. The only bit that survives from this whole era is a chunk of wall <laughs> from the Blackfriars Monastery. So nothing of the actual theatre remains, but this is the only glimpse you can get of the original foundations of the building. One of the first indoor theatres, which apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, but I read it and I found it interesting that the whole concept of an interval came from the need to reignite the candles, to restock the candles. Again, I find that an interesting insight. This allowed a whole new way of theatre being done because at the Globe, for example, or the theatre or the Curtain, this was an open air theatre, which was the, the plays were performed at midday from sort of one till 3 p.m. in the summertime. In the winter, there was no theatre. But when you have something like this, an indoor theater like the Blackfriars Theater, you can have indoor performances, which completely changes the way theater can be done. It can be done all year round for one thing, but also it can be done much more intimately as opposed to this open air situation with a huge space. You have a very intimate space lit by candles. This is where the Tempest was first put on. And this quote from 
the tempest I find quite atmospheric to imagine in a small space lit by candles. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Another building that survives to this day from Shakespeare's time is the Middle Temple. The Middle Temple is an area called Temple Inn. It's an area to the west of the center of London. If you look it up today, it's still called Temple, and it's where the inns of court are to this day. If you want to become a barrister, I believe you still have to study in one of these four inns of court. And this was a heritage in Shakespeare's time too. The inns of court were called the third university. You had Oxford, you had Cambridge, and then you had the inns of court because you were taught law, but you were also taught basic things about the world, which Oxford and Cambridge were learning about. And they were very sophisticated and high-minded and every year they would put on plays in order for the lawyers to show their ability to speak in public and to speak well. And this is where, for example, um, Twelfth Night was first put on. This is Shakespeare putting on this play in front of a very sophisticated audience, an audience thinking very highly of themselves. But I find it a great moment of his humor because in this play, there's a moment when Malvolio is being kept inside this room. And uh, he says this. This is a part of the dialogue when he then replies. So this is someone else talking. Madam, thou errest. I say there is no darkness, but ignorance in which thou art more puzzled than the Egyptians in their fog. And Malvolio says, I say this house is as dark as ignorance. The lovely irony is that the house is one of the lightest buildings in the whole of London in the sense that there are these huge windows flooding in light all around. But this character is saying, no matter about the physical light, this house is as dark as ignorance. These people think they know things, but they actually don't. It's a lovely, lovely moment there to kind of take down the, the cultured elite. There's another lovely moment set at the Middle Temple in London, which is the, um, the moment from uh, Henry the, oh God, sorry, Henry the Sixth. <laughs> God, so many Henrys. Henry the Sixth, where there's this famous scene with the roses. So you can still see a rose garden in the temple in London. And this scene here set in the Wars of the Roses in the 1400s, where when England came out of it and came out of this huge civil war, largely this Elizabethan golden age uh, could happen. So this is a scene where the different powers that be are deciding upon which side they'll take in this civil war. Richard Plantagenet says, since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Let him that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honor of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this blyer pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colors. And without all color of base insinuating flattery, I plucked this white rose with Plantagenet. 
I pluck this red rose with young Somerset and say with all, I think he held the right. So that garden is still there today and is the scene of one of these very famous instances in English history. Another area where Shakespeare performed and which was important in Shakespeare's London, very important, was Westminster. This was the area to the west of London. It was the Westminster, so the East Minster was St Paul's and the West Minster was Westminster Abbey, these religious buildings. This is an old drawing or painting of the Whitehall Palace which was a palace built up by Henry VIII and it became the main center for government until about 1700 when it burned down. And there was a theater in this place. This is a drawing of what the area used to look like with Whitehall Palace here, one of the biggest palaces in Europe before Versailles in France and St. James's Park here, which still exists, and St. James's Palace up here. Today, it's this area here. You can still see St. James's Park and St. James's Palace, but now the building that used to be Whitehall Palace is taken up by largely governmental buildings like the Treasury, the, the Defence, um, and the Cabinet Building, stuff like this, and of course the famous Houses of Parliament here. But it's here, for example, that King Lear was first put on. Incredibly topical, considering that the king was James I, who also had various children, the same as King Lear had children in this play, and he gets it all a bit wrong, and he gives his territory to two of the daughters as opposed to one for all the wrong reasons, and his whole empire falls apart and he's left a broken man. So it would have been here in Westminster to hear this famous speech from King Lear when he's been cast out from his family, from his kingdom, and he's wandering in the deserts. Blow winds and crack your cheeks, rage, blow. You cataracts and hurricanoes spout Till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks, you sulphurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers to oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head, and thou shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's molds, all germane spill at once that makes ungrateful man. Rumble thy bellyful, spit fire, spout rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire, my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. Today, we tend to respect Shakespeare and to say, yes, she was very good. Yes, of course, Shakespeare, it's the greatest literature in the whole world. But contemporaries did not necessarily feel like that. One of those was Samuel Pepys, who wrote a wonderful diary about his daily life. And in that, he describes three instances of going to see Shakespeare <laughs> in Westminster and not really liking it. Saw Midsummer Night's Dream, which I have never seen before, nor shall ever again for it is the most insipid, ridiculous play that I ever saw in my life. There was, I confess, some good dancing and some handsome women, but that was all of my pleasure. 
Saw Twelfth Night acted well, though it be but a silly play and not relating at all to the name or day. Though I went with the resolution to like Henry VIII, it's so simple a thing, made up of a great many patches, that there is nothing in the work. So I thought I'd include that little element there to show that he wasn't immediately greatly respected. One very famous building in London is St Paul's. This is the old St Paul's, this Gothic building that was there, it was one of the tallest churches in Europe before it burnt down in 1666 in the fire of London. And St Paul's churchyard here was one of the biggest open spaces in the city of London. This was the, the throbbing heart of the city. This was the commercial hub, the spiritual hub. It was a hub where you could go to get people killed. You could go to pick up a prostitute. You could go to bribe people. You could go to get debts paid. You could go to loan money. It was a whole kind of central square of the city. And this was the the main area in London. This was a huge central space at the time. Today, it's quite a small space in the center of London. But this was the place where, for example, you would go to hear sermons being announced. You would go to hear news being broadcast. Today, it's still called St. Paul's Churchyard. And it's a little tiny space with some trees, very peaceful with the, 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 the new St. Paul's built in the early 1700s by Christopher Wren in a very different style. This area here is called Paternoster Row. And this was the book market center of medieval London. This is where you would go to look at books. That was where all the bookshops were. So no doubt Shakespeare would have been there browsing along these bookshelves, looking at different texts to take inspiration from for his plays. If you do join my tour later on Shakespeare readings, most of his plays come from some older tradition of literature. Just to the east of St Paul's, which is behind this building here today, is Cheapside, which means the market area in Old English. And today it's full of pret a mangers and Nespresso's and Gap and Next and all these kind of big chains it's still busy, but it's often only really busy at kind of lunch times and after work hours because this area is now completely, um, it's not residential at all, but back in Shakespeare's time, the whole area of this area was London itself. This is Cheapside in 1639, so a few years after Shakespeare died. This was the place, this was the Oxford Street. This was the Rodeo Drive, the Fifth Avenue, whatever reference you want for the main street, a famous main street where you can get anything. And so, yes, this was this main street in, in Shakespeare's time. Here's an old drawing from the 1700s, still showing St. Mary's Le Beau Church, which still exists. And also this old colored photo from the 1800s showing how busy it was as a proper market street, as opposed to something a bit more kind of industrial bland uh, today. Another very important building which I mentioned earlier, which Shakespeare would have certainly been to, is the Royal Exchange. So this is it in its original garb, built by a merchant called Thomas Gresham in the mid 1500s and opened by Elizabeth I. It was one of the first places in England where merchants could actually gather and do their business together and to exchange different commodities, especially things like stocks. And uh, was, this was the beginning of the stock market and the stock exchange taken from models in, in Holland, in, in Antwerp especially. Samuel Pepys mentions it, for example, only a few decades after Shakespeare dies as a place where he would go to buy nice things for his wife, for example. Uh, today, the building is a Victorian recreation. It's still called the Royal Exchange. It's still got an open area inside as a cafe and various shops, but it's not anymore a site of intense commercial activity 
as it would have been in Shakespeare's day. So in 1613, the globe burns down. Fires were quite a large part of <laughs> London's history and the globe did not escape that fate and it burnt down in 1613. Shakespeare then stops writing plays and dies three years later in Stratford-upon-Avon in 1616. To end with, I wanted to use, to, to point out one place in the center of London, which is very touching. It's a church called St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury, very long name. It got bombed in the Second World War. And so all that's left is this little series of trees and some ruins within this little park right in the center of the city of London. And in the gardens of this church where the burial ground used to be is a statue and the statue is of Shakespeare. This spot is where two of Shakespeare's friends and fellow actors were buried, John Hemming and Henry Condell. And they actually got together their own money, their own energies and published Shakespeare's plays, tragedies, comedies, history plays into one folio in 1623. So it's because of these two guys, you know, all we can say is it's because of them. Without them, Shakespeare, many of Shakespeare's plays may never have been published. We may only have fragments left or hearsay. And they're buried in this graveyard because they lived around here. So to go to this little very nondescript park in the center of London, again, it's very unbusy. It's not the London Eye or, you know, the Houses of Parliament, Madame Tussauds. It's just this little park to really, in a way, feel the influence of Shakespeare, to consider that these guys buried here published his works, which has made such a huge contribution to cinema, film, theater, poetry, literature over the next 400 years. And a fitting time to mention one of Shakespeare's most famous monologues from As You Like It, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. So that's an introduction to Shakespeare's London. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new or a different angle onto things. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Shall I stop sharing my screen, yeah? Um, no, not yet. So um, tell us about the other program you're doing later today, like maybe a sneak yeah, preview. So and uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I included the information in the in the chat, but I'll also email it to people if you wanna sign okay, up for Okay, so let me say one thing. Um, I'll explain that. I'm really happy to answer any questions. I really need to go to the bathroom, which will take about two minutes. Oh yeah, sure. So, um, <laughs> okay, no, what let, is, let, let you do that. Take your time and let me do so that. Actually, let let, me, do let me do that. And then I'll come back in like literally one and a half minutes, but I'm, I'm bursting. I've had too much water. Oh yeah, no problem. So this is the program he's doing a little bit later today. So I included the Eventbrite um, link in the chat earlier, but I'll email it out to folks as soon as we get done, if you want to sign up for that. So um, he did the initial, he did this program about a month ago. And when he was doing the readings, um, he got such great feedback. Um, I asked him, I said, you know, I think it would be really interesting if you just did a whole program on nothing but reading from Shakespeare. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, or sure. Okay, no problem. So um, that's the kind of the gist of that. But when he comes back, he can tell you more about it. But yeah, again, I'll email that out if you wanna join us later today. And then we are recording this program. However, the recordings can be um, hit or miss. Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. So if there is, if the recording works out okay, 
I'll also email that as well. We will post it on our Facebook and our YouTube page, but again, it's not a guarantee that it'll um, go through okay. So that. holy bladder rack, brilliant. Okay, so any questions? Oh yeah, so later in about three hours at 8 p.m. UK time, I'm doing a an hour on different texts from Shakespeare, different histories of his different plays, and then quotes from those plays. So feel free to join for that. Again, it's free. Um, I'm very happy to take any donations you might feel willing to give. Um, I, how should I give my? I can give my PayPal address. Is that is that is that best? Yeah, sure. Do uh -huh. you have that on a screen somewhere, or do you want me to email that, or do you want to just read it off? Or you want to? Yeah, I mean, you can you can you can email it. Um, I, I really should have prepared something, I guess. But um, oh, that's okay. Let me here. I have an idea. I'll let you. It'll take me a second to pull this up. But hold on. Yes, I know not everyone uses PayPal. Sorry, but I, I'm not sure I have an alternative really. Um, but um, I mean, Robert can give you my email. So if you want to email me with anything, that's that'd be very welcome. Again, not trying to push it, just putting it out there. Okay, I just sent that out. Did you see that, Edward? I posted it in the comments. Yeah, that's okay. Good. Know. Yeah. So if you want to contact Edward for anything, by all means, feel free to do so. And then it's not on our calendar yet, but he's going to do this other program in I think a couple of weeks where he's going to be um, talking about the letters that Vincent Van Gogh wrote and doing readings from that as well. So that's we don't have that on the calendar just yet. I'll probably post that tomorrow and tied up doing other stuff. Um, so I'll email that as well. Going to be reading from the letters that Vincent Van Gogh wrote to his brother and other people, so that should be fascinating. Learn about within that. the within within the context of his painting. So it'll be his paintings, and then the the context of his his actual insight into his paintings. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be a lot of fun. So we'll send that out as well. Um, let's see. It's hard to tell if people have questions <laughs> because there's so many other um, people chiming in with different things. I guess if someone has a question, you asked it earlier, and if Edward didn't ask it, if you want to answer, ask it again now, and him and I are both looking at the questions or the chat thing now, we'll take a look at that. So Don Anberg, is there any recent scholarly discussion on the authorship of Shakespeare, um, especially Edward de Vere? I mean, there is, there's a lot of, so as far as I know, the actual, principal scholarship of Shakespeare, it's very debatable whether it's it's scholarship because there's very, very little evidence that Shakespeare didn't write the plays, whereas there is at least some evidence that he did. There are various people like Sir Philip Sidney or Francis Bacon that he did, in fact, um, uh, he wasn't the author. I can't relate to something directly about the people that perhaps did write Shakespeare, but a brief search will show you many things, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in the, the scholarship that is saying that he didn't write it. I'm sorry, Don, that I can't answer it more concretely. Um, oh, it's okay. Don's a smart, worldly guy. He knows a lot of interesting stuff himself. Someone asked about residuals for Shakespeare. So <laughs> are, this, are there any residuals for Shakespeare? Like, what is What do you mean by residuals? Oh, you know, like when you write a book and they end up, like if you wrote a book on something and they ended up selling it, you would get, you know, like a certain amount of money for every book sold. So they probably don't have that for Shakespeare, I'm guessing. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't, that's what I I don't mean. know. I, 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 I really don't know that, that that's a great question. If anyone is getting uh, royalties, you mean? Yeah, royalties. Uh huh. Yeah, that's, no, a that's, that's a very good exactly. question. That's a very good question. I'm 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 not sure if Shakespeare's direct lineage uh, survives, but uh, yeah, maybe they're all just in the public domain. Yeah. Um. Someone asked about, Frank 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 Pedula was asking um about the about uh, great composers living in Shakespeare's time. I think Henry Purcell was later, but not entirely sure. People like William Byrd, 
um, uh, have these fantastic choral pieces that were made for the, the Royal Chapel. So if you look at people like um, William Byrd, for example, um, B-Y-R-D, they have these beautiful, beautiful pieces of music, uh, choral pieces of music um, from the 1500s. In fact, Elizabeth I was a huge proponent in actually keeping the choral tradition alive after the change to Protestant, to the Church of England from, from the Catholic, Catholic world. Yeah. Beautiful music. Yeah. Um, are you going to have more programs about Shakespeare? If there's the demand for it, I'm always keen to, there are infinite angles to do, infinite readings to do. It was very hard for me to choose the readings that I did choose for a few hours time. So, so certainly, you know, if people want to suggest ideas, I'm definitely open to that. Yeah, so we had um, over 900 the first time, and this was the encore performance, and we had over 800 on right. um, Zoom, and then quite a few more are watching on Facebook Live, and they're commenting and chatting stuff. But yeah, if someone if someone has a particular topic about Shakespeare they want to know, feel free to type it in the Q. &A. Also, um, P Pam said that unfortunate the sound kept fading in and out. Was this something you noticed too, Robert? Oh, only just. Um, early on and then after we fixed that there was a spot like about maybe 25 percent of the way in where the sound went out for like five seconds it, but it didn't seem to happen ever again so yeah right so. right right so this is a uh, transatlantic um program i'm in austin texas currently at the moment and edwards in london so <laughs> sometimes sometimes we're at the mercy of technology right right and and yes i mean if, if you can't make the reading session tonight, Wenting Gao is, is asking about uh, any chance you may organize the reading program again in the near future. Um, oh, so we were gonna try and record it. Um, so we record programs and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. So we'll try and record it. And if you can't make it in the recording, well, if we record it and the recording works out okay, we'll send it out to people that you can watch it in the future. If you don't hear anything of us about the recording, that means the, the recording didn't work out, which usually okay. it does, but not, but not always. Um, Cindy, Cindy Schenkel is asking, where is Shakespeare buried? Uh, he's buried in Stratford-upon-Avon. Oh yeah, we would, Edward and I talked about maybe doing a presentation like this about that area at some point in time. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, someone else asked a presentation on Elizabeth I would be great, which I've, I've already noted down in my notes to do one. So yeah, definitely. So Kate asked, does Facebook Live automatically save the recording? It does, Kate, but um, every once in a while, they end up taking it down for whatever reason, um, or there's hiccups with it. So yes, they do, but that's not a guarantee it'll stick to it. Mm. Let's see, Debbie says screen not advancing. Well, Debbie, we're not showing any more slides. It's just the, we just uh, left this up for now. So. We don't really have anything else to. So Patricia is asking the role of women actors in Shakespeare's plays. So as far as we know, there were no women actors in Shakespeare's plays. They were all often young men acting the women's roles. It unfortunately wasn't seen as the thing to do to include women. But if you do join my tour later, I'll be talking about the character Rosalind in As You Like It, who's one of the most uh, famous female characters written by Shakespeare, although of course it's acted by a man who's a man acting as a woman who then turns into the figure of a man as Rosalind changes her gender in the play for a time. So I will be talking about the, the Shakespeare's attitude towards women um, and quite an advanced attitude for that, for that era um, uh, later on. Um, there, there are many roles written as women, but they're not, you know, they're not written for women. They're written for men to perform in Shakespeare's time as women. So, I mean, it's pretty complicated. Nicholas suggested Shakespearean fashions. Do you know anything about that? That would be interesting. Fashions oh, yeah, is, I mean, the, was always an interesting historical topic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the rough that you can see, I mean, I, I know of someone who lives in London who, who, who solely dresses in, in Regency fashion in the early, from the early 1800s. But the, the kind of, for example, the, the, slashed, the slashed leather that a lot of the, the Tudors wore where they would have these leather 
um, or not leather, they would have these coats, jackets, like you can see Shakespeare wearing here, and it would be slashed. The leather would be cut a bit like we have ripped jeans. It's a great topic, a uh, great, great suggestion. I'll write it down. What about, did he ever get into hot water or even arrested for the unflattering royalty stuff? No, he managed to survive that. I mean, other people like Sir Walter Raleigh didn't do so well, but um, there's a lot to say about Shakespeare's plays walking the line between actually suggesting things that could be dangerous, like corrupt power of kingship or the corrupt power of the church or something like this, with actually then trying to fit in to the accepted norms. So never being too taboo. In Elizabethan times, for example, Queen Elizabeth I, if you openly talked about the, the danger of succession, because she didn't have any kids, you could be killed, you could be arrested. So, I mean, yeah, but there's, I mean, this is 400 years of scholarship about this kind of topic. So it's, it's, it's huge, it's huge, fascinating. Yeah. Women were sewn into their dresses and lived in them 24 seven for a year. <laughs> smell <laughs> oh and then, um when amanda, you were talking the, the amanda briggs that the paypal um robert robert wrote a he wrote my email in there so that that's the email that you can use as the the donation address um, maybe Robert will send it again afterwards or put it on the meetup page. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll email it out to folks along with the, um, this other Shakespeare program. And then when you were during your presentation, I was telling people that um, after the COVID ends, we'll plan a group uh, in-person trip to London and you can show us this stuff in person. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, this is just part one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he was never arrested. Shakespeare, as far as we know, was never arrested for his uh, for the political views presented in the plays. Um, yeah. um, there's one theory. So someone asked, do you know what roles Shakespeare played? One of the roles, apocryphally, is Adam in As You Like It, which is quite a minor role. We know, we it's quite clear that he wrote certain roles for Richard Burbage, for example, Hamlet, which I'll talk about later on this evening. Um, Richard Burbage was the actual owner of the Lord Chamberlain's company, the guy who was originally financing it. The actual roles that Shakespeare played, very little is known. As I said before, so little is known about his life. It's incredibly frustrating that there's so much text, <laughs> but so little known about the actual man. If indeed it was one man. Uh, but as I said, there's very little evidence to concretely suggest it was someone else. Um, so it, it, it unfortunately is a lot of speculation. If it, if it wasn't Shakespeare, if it wasn't one man, you have to develop, you have to develop theories that it was other people. Any other questions coming in? Yeah. Call it a day. Someone asked, do you watch the PBS Upstart Crow sitcom? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that one. So it is, again, so the people that made questions and comments, that's actually one of my favorite parts about doing this because I always end up learning a lot um, people tell, mentioning things that I wasn't aware of, or just sharing their perspective of things um, you know I hadn't considered. So thanks for all your questions and comments today. He was able to support his family in the theater business. So he oh, yeah. was able to I mean, himself. Oh, definitely. Own. From from the 1590s, he seems to have been successful and to earn a, a lot of money. He bought another house in Stratford upon Avon. He even um, had his family uh, made a, a coat of arms 
so to elevate them to a higher position in society um, so it wasn't a side hustle <laughs> no no he, he became very very wealthy to buy one of the biggest houses in stratford upon avon yeah Okay, well, why don't we... Um, sorry, what, what, one more thing. Uh, Don Anberg said, I have a very hard time understanding Old English. Are there any guides, lessons that can help one interpret Old English? Um, oh, it's, I was using it recently. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. I, I, I can't look so easily. What, one, one, one second, one second, one second. Because um, it's... If it, something it, comes to you, you can send it to me. Don's my... Um buddy and neighbor in uh, Columbia, Maryland. Hey, Don. I think it's called, it could be called No Fear, No Fear Shakespeare. That's it. Um, if you type in No no Fear Shakespeare, then you can, you can find the, the texts and then next to it, it has the, the modern translation, which is actually really helpful. Yeah, there you go. Um, are you still there, Robert? Yes. I'm oh, okay. Googling the, the no fear. Okay, yeah. So Kathy asked, do you know how the globe burnt down in 1613? I'm pretty sure it was a, a pretty banal accident. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was a, a, a an eruption. For, I think it was Henry VIII play and it was a, a cannon that was fired as part of the performance and the cannon fired blanks, but one of the sparks ignited the roof of the theater and it burnt down because of one of the performances. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, okay, well, why don't we call it a day again? I'll email the folks out the information on the other stuff we discussed. So this was awesome. Thanks again. Um, everyone enjoy the rest of your day and weekend and we will see you all again soon. And special thanks to Edward for educating us on Shakespeare. I feel much smarter than I was uh, hour and as fifteen. Much as, I, as much as I could, as much as I, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are there are holes to poke. But thank you very much for joining. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was awesome. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you guys.